Good afternoon. Please be very welcome uh, here. Um, we welcome you, your presence, the presence of our speakers. Uh, we have a very gender balanced panel, uh, especially now that the president of the competition council is not here. Unfortunately, uh, he is in a meeting and he will uh, be a bit late, but he, he mentioned that he will, uh, he will join us until the end of the event. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we have here um, Diego. Um, he is an experienced lawyer with uh, skate and arts and an uh, associate professor with Bocconi University. Um, he has two presentations for, uh, for today. Uh, we, we also have here Gustavo, he is the managing director of uh, CRH, Romania, uh, a large company very active on the Romanian uh, market. Uh, we also have with us uh, Diana Calcio. Uh, Diana is living for a long time in Brussels and she works there as a competition uh, lawyer with Gilles Brussels. Uh, and uh, we also have with us uh, Cosmina Baciu. Uh, uh, Cosmina Simeon, sorry. <laughs> Cosmina Simeon, yeah, I was thinking that, uh, yeah, she's uh, with Anna Baciu having their own uh, law firm now. Um, and she's an ex DLA Piper and an NTKP uh, lawyer who will share with us uh, very good insights on data protection uh, issues. So um, please uh, uh, benefit of this occasion to uh, ask as many questions as possible, uh, to have a very dynamic and uh, engaging discussion. In this, uh, uh, in this discussion, Bogdan Manola, um, uh, who is the moderator of the event, will help you um, make the bridge with the, with the speakers. Um, and yeah, let's just start. Uh, Bogdan, if you have some, um, some uh, ideas about the, uh, the unfolding of the events, please share them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you all for, for coming here. Um, we just see that uh, it, it might be difficult for everyone in the room to see everyone, so I'll just move a bit so everyone will see me. But if you have uh, uh, questions at any moment in time, just to raise your hand and try to make a sign, either to the speaker that is presenting, either to, to us here, and we'll try to introduce. So, so your questions will not remain uh, unanswered. Uh, just a, a couple of uh, uh, formal announcements. So, um, uh, as Raluca has uh, pointed out, that the Kiritsoyo is late, but uh, he will uh, um, he <coughs> promise that uh, he will come, so we'll try to uh, feed the lead in uh, within the, to a couple of uh, presentations. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, and um, please don't forget to, uh, to also feed in the feedback questionnaire that we have uh, here. So either after each presentation, uh, either uh, at the end, but uh, try to um, to keep, uh, keep in mind to, to give us a feedback about the, what is uh, happening here. Uh, and with uh, no further ado, we can start and we'll uh, take advantage of the fact that uh, Mr. Gian Diego Pini has arrived in time, just in time. Uh, and we'll start with the first presentation uh, on the competition uh, regarding disclosure of data in M&A. Here we go. Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, so first of all, I thank you, thank you very much to Raluca and the uh, May Conference for, for inviting me. And I'm very sorry I was kind of on time, so <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, it was a bit late uh, to, be, to be fair. Uh, the reason is that I just flew in, so uh, it wasn't my fault. It was the, it was the plane's fault or uh, the pilot's. Um, so what I'm going to be discussing uh, as a first topic is Let's say what happens whenever you have a whenever you have an M&A transaction, and what are the issues from an antitrust perspective when it comes to disclosure of data, exchange of information, and so on. So this is uh, I'm gonna I mean you I think you you already have or you will have the slides, so I'm I'm not gonna just repeat what's on the slides. It doesn't make any sense. 
Uh, you can just read them. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is to base it on, on my experience, hopefully on your experience as well, and then I mean, if you have questions that on something that I didn't touch upon, something that happened to you, something that you're interested in, you can just, you can just ask. Um, so, just to start, uh, the idea here is just to say that whenever there is a transaction, exchange of information is a fundamental part. So you do need to exchange information, you do need to have access to information. So there is no, I don't think there is anybody, uh, being it an authority, being it a lawyer, being it anybody, that thinks that you can actually have a transaction without exchanging information. And also it is very unlikely that you can have a transaction without exchanging competitively sensitive information. So the idea is that that has to happen, that needs to happen. It is very important that it happens. It, it is important for the parties, but it is important also for the market. Because of course there is no interest by any competition authority to have suboptimal transactions. So transactions where the price of the target is much lower than its actual value, or vice versa, or transactions that end up in buying something or someone that you didn't want to buy, or that you didn't need, or that it won't lead to efficiency. So this is always to be kept in mind, because the idea is that if everything works well, so if you are exchanging information just for the purpose of the transaction, there is no competition issue. So it is justified by the transaction. So by the efficiencies, let's say, coming from the transaction. So this, is, this, this needs to be kept in mind because otherwise, so if there was no transaction, then you would have issues exchanging the exact same type of information, even adopting the same safeguards and so on. So the transaction itself is the idea of a transaction, the existence of a transaction, the need to exchange data is the justification to do something that otherwise you couldn't so the idea here is that the seller will need, will want to actually get data. So the idea is that the data will go mainly in one direction. So if it goes also in the other direction, it's kind of a problem. So the seller will want to give data about the target, but shouldn't really get data about the buyer, with certain exceptions, of course. I mean, they may be may be interested in, for example, employment, what they what they plan on doing with their employees, and so on. So there may be exceptions. But most of the time, the direction of, of, the, of the data is, in, is one. So it's from the seller that wants to get you know, a fair price, or to show the performances, and so on, to the buyer that wants to pay the right price, that wants to make sure that he's not liable for anything that he wasn't uh, aware of, and to determine whether the transaction makes sense. So it's, it's not just the value of the target. It's not that anybody will buy any target. They will buy the target that makes sense in the organization. So they also need to understand how to integrate it. I, I will spend more time on this slide and then I will go faster and just to give you an example. If you are a bidder, right, and you're just starting to bid and you are a competitor, you will probably have access to less information than you would have access if you had already signed the agreement because you don't need as many information during the bidding phase instead of the, the, the post sign phase, because in the post signing phase you will start also doing some integration planning, so thinking what's going to happen after you close. Um, and if you are, a, if you are a, a competitor, what you could be doing, which is something that does happen, uh, just participate to the bid, even if you're not interested in the target, just to get the information. So this is the reason why normally during a bidding you don't have access to the same amount of information, and if you are a competitor, you have access to less information. So for example, if a PE fund participates to a, to a bidding contest and it doesn't have other companies that are active in the same market, it will probably it will be justified for it to be to have access to more information than somebody that is actually active in the market and is a competitor. So you can already see that, 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 it, that it is very case specific, it is very specific to the, to the companies involved, it's very specific to the transaction and so on. So what are the data, and then between signing and closing, you have several activities that we're going to discuss afterwards, but one of these is integration planning, which is the one where you need the most information. So you need the information, you kind of already need to know what the target is in, in its entirety, like how its business works, is, is customers, is suppliers, you will need pretty much all of this information in order to start integrate, start thinking about integration. So you cannot integrate, you cannot actually, you know, um, merge the two yet because you are still going through the, um, 
the antitrust investigation and the antitrust review, but you can start thinking about it. And that is the most difficult moment because you just have the two, you, the two thinks that the transaction is gonna happen because they signed, so it is gonna happen. In the worst case scenario, they're gonna offer remedies, but we're gonna get through this. And at the same time, you want to start doing something that you would otherwise have to do after closing well, and therefore delay the integration, which means delaying efficiencies and so on. So you want to start as early as possible. And these are all the types of information that you, that there may be issues, let's say, exchanging. Uh, I'm not gonna go through them specifically, except, except for maybe uh, thinking about the industry. So these are pretty much all of the strategic information that you may be exchanging. So all of the elements of competition between two, two companies. Of course, this changes based on the industry, right? So in some industries, there will be some things that are already disclosed to the public. So some prices may be already, already well known, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe not be confidential, so you may not, not need to, uh, to care about those. You can, you can share them. Uh, in some other cases, you will have, uh, you will have, for example, a set of prices, you can have fees, or in some cases, you can have the, um, the suppliers, the suppliers relationship being more important than the relationship with your customers in terms of competition. So if you think about, for example, uh, a merger in the food and uh, food and beverage industry, you will see you will see that some information, for example, the price of the product to the consumers being much less relevant than the price of the product to the supermarket, for example. Or if the or if the transaction is between a supermarket and uh, and uh, and uh, a company active in the food and uh, food and beverage industry, then of course the supermarket will have its own prices, but they but they will want to know, and that is the reason why they shouldn't have access to it until the transaction completes, the price that, is, that, that the same product is sold to another supermarket, for example, because this is where they compete. So even in a vertical, let's say, transaction, this can be also a horizontal transaction. So of course, the supermarket itself may have products in competition with those of the food and beverage uh, company. And in that case, of course, you also have an issue there. So you may have new, um, new products uh, coming into the market that you don't want you know, your competitor to know about. You may have a supplier relationship uh, um, with someone you know, producing the boxes, for example, or, or the, um, or the uh, raw material that you don't want to disclose and you don't want the, the other company to have access to it. You don't want the prices, maybe you don't want the rebate system that you have with other supermarkets. So maybe the prices are not that complicated, maybe they are exactly the same, maybe everybody has the same list prices. So you can, everybody has the list, but not everybody has the rebate. So it depends on each individual transaction. There will be an each individual industry. So there will be industries where all of this is, is irrelevant, but what is more, the most relevant is, is R&D. So it's completely transparent, but you, what you care about is what's gonna happen next. So you don't care about what's happening today because you, you know it, maybe it's, it's a very concentrated industry, you don't have that many competitors. This may be a, the case, for example, in, uh, in uh, telecommunication. So if you have a, a very concentrated market with just two or three players, the difference with, with, between these will not be the, the main element the say, of competition, the strategic information may not be the price that they are charging the customers, because that may be public, that's probably public. It may be the new offer, the one that they are, they are developing and they want to launch, and they want to be the first ones to launch it, and there's some time to actually get the customers from the other one. So it depends a lot on the individual industry. It may be the plans to launch a new, um, a new network, for example, a, a faster network. It may be the, uh, the plan to actually buy antennas, for example. It may be the suppliers, the relationship with the suppliers of antennas. So it's all of this, all of this depends on the industry very much. But what's important is if you, if you think about that data, if you don't want that data to be public, and you don't want, and even more, you don't want the data to be in the hands of your competitor, then it shouldn't be in the hands of, of your competitor just because you're buying it or because this, this one is being bought, right? or because you are being bought by this other one. So the idea is you are still competitors, you should still behave exactly the same way as you would behave otherwise, with the exception of 
the need to do this, for example, or to do or to respond to the uh, authority's request or to preserve the value of the target. So there are exceptions, but otherwise the relationship should stay on that. So this is the, uh, the legal framework, and I'm, I'm just going to go through it very quickly, just saying that the reason why we are discussing this is that when you notify, and I'm, I'm taking the EU approach, of course, so when you're notifying a transaction, then you cannot close. You have to wait until the authority uh, analyzes the transaction and says that the transaction is fine. So the reason why you cannot integrate, the reason why you cannot exchange information is that the, the authority needs first to actually review it. And the reason, and the reason why you can't exchange information, uh, and the reason why you can close and so on, is because of, let's say this, this kind of sums it up. So once you have, once the, uh, once the eggs are scrambled, you cannot unscramble them. So you have even a case, I mean, I'm gonna discuss it later, where they, they specifically say, once you have disclosed the information, you cannot take it back. The information is out there, okay? The, the buyer, Got it. So in that specific case, which, which is Altis, so probably you already, you already heard of it, the, um, there was a specific competition issue and there was a divestment in an overlap. So if you disclose all of the information about this overlap, let's say, about the business overlap in business, and then you, and then you divest it, you're divesting something that, that everybody knows everything about at the company that is divesting it. So if I am the buyer of this divestment business, I will know that I will never ever be able to compete with you, at least in, on the same terms, because you already know all my cards. So this is the reason why you have this, you have this standstill obligation. So you cannot close and therefore you cannot exchange information. Now, what happens? So there is a there is a very important reason why it makes sense for the authority to allow the exchange of information within these, let's say, uh, specific objectives. And the reason is that pre-signing, of course, I, we already discussed it, so there is an interest in the market functioning well, including the acquisition market. But after signing, there is an interest in the transaction closing as quickly as possible and having as little, let's say, impact on each of the parties' business as possible. Why? Because once you're signed, then you get press release from both companies that always say, you know, we signed this agreement and we are uh, going undergoing, you know, the uh, antitrust review. So the transaction will close on this day, subject to antitrust review, subject to clearance. This is the press release. It's, it's almost always the case because nobody lawyers look look at it uh, before it goes out. Uh, issue is the press, for example, or the employees. So on the press, it will be A buys B. That's it. It won't say that there is an antitrust investigation. It will not say that it will take this long. It, will, it does not say that it could not happen, that the transaction could not happen. It's just A buys B. And then it explains what are the effects and the reasons for it and so on. So the market already thinks, oh, okay, so this happened. So these two companies are one now, right? And the employees, lots of them will think, oh, okay, so we are working for this other one now. So we're not competing with them anymore, or we're not um, negotiating at arm's length. We're not, when we are going to, uh, to the supermarket to sell our product, we're not selling it to a third party. We don't, we don't need to actually get as much as we can from this third party. It is us, so we can just give it for less, or we can just, Ask, listen, uh, we're going to give you this, and you can give us something else. We can give them any information they want, and so on. So there is a there is a softening of competition between these two players, and this is even worse worsened by the fact that even if employees knew and they and they were they got the information, the communication, and the press is very is very thorough and specifically say it may happen, it may have both be, let's wait for the antitrust authority to, to decide. Even if that happens, still you have your incentives change. So if you are the target, why would you risk pissing off your future employee? So you are, you are discussing, you're negotiating, for example, if it's a vertical murder with someone, or you are competing with someone, right? 
and going for the same customer. Why would you, you know, step on his foot? Why would you do that? I mean, it's like today it's fine, and then tomorrow you're gonna be under it. So you you have very little incentive. You will you should still compete, but your incentives are much much lower. At the same time, the seller has no incentive to invest whatsoever because it sold the business, except. If there is a specific clause, normally there are clauses in the SBA that says you know the, the business needs to be run as as usual and so on. But there are a lot of things that can be debated whether they are as usual or not. So what happens is that the seller will decrease his investments. They will put much less money, will try to get as much money out as possible from the product, from the target. And then the buyer, of course, sold something, so an opportunity in the transaction. So it should be able, it wants to, to uh, integrate and to get these, these benefits as quickly as possible. So there is an interest to, to make sure that this phase is as short as possible, let's say. But of course, this does not really depend on the parties. And sometimes it doesn't really depend on the authority either, because there is time necessary to prepare the filing, there, is, there are questions, the analysis needs to be thorough, and so on. So what you want to do, is to avoid that this time is actually a limbo during which nothing happens, the two parties are just separate as if nothing had happened, but with everybody having in mind that actually something has happened. So you want to make sure that this time is not completely wasted. And this is the reason why you can exchange information to do specific things. And the things are these ones, in theory. I mean, there may be others, but like these are the normal ones. So the normal ones are, you need to make sure that the target and the transaction keeps its value. So you need to know, for example, let's say that the seller, for whatever reason, decides that doesn't want to invest at all, doesn't want to spend even money on maintaining the facilities. So, or even on, it doesn't send anybody, any, for example, um, any sales representative to, uh, to negotiate. Because it doesn't, it doesn't care anymore, it doesn't want to spend the money, it doesn't want you know, the sales representative use the car and use, and use some money for gas, right? So let's assume that the buyer would not know because this is an internal information, right? This is an information that is confidential, let's say, right? And to a certain extent, the buyer should be able to know what's happening in the business that he has bought. So as long as it is limited to just maintaining the value, so like minority investors, a minority investor will have information rights Will, be, will get some information, will get some updates, but it, it, it's not a controlling shareholder. It cannot keeps on asking information, any information he wants. It cannot keep on like having meetings with the business and so on. So it is okay to, to, to get the information, to ask for information, as long as it is limited to just maintaining the value of the transaction. This is one, so, and this is the exception. This is the, it's almost never mentioned, but I mean, a lot of time, uh, the, um, the buyer needs the information just to respond to the authority's request. So the buyer notifies the transaction, the authority asks questions, the authority will ask questions about both the buyer and the target. The buyer does not have information about the target, so it needs to get this information. And sometimes this information needs to be available even to someone at the buyer. Because the buyer will need to see it and will need somebody, someone at the buyer will need to see it and will need to determine what is the best strategy. So most of the times it can stop at the council level, but sometimes, or so lawyers level, but sometimes the buyer wants to know what the lawyers are gonna plead. And in that case, some people at the buyer will need to have access to this information for nothing more than responding to requests for information or preparing the plan. Um, last one is prepare for integration. Is the most important one. Is the biggest one, uh, the biggest source of, of issues, let's say. And the reason why there are issues is that if the um, employees consider the trust colleagues and consider the transaction as or at, as if it had already happened, the first thing they do is they speak to each other and say, okay, so what are we going to do? Are we going to launch this product? Are we going to launch this other product? Are we going to stop developing this and put all all money on this other one? Are we gonna merge the, our relationship with the suppliers? What are your suppliers? What are my suppliers? What prices are you charging this specific, um, for example, business customers? Or what are you, um, or um, what are your, for example, uh, foreign, let's say that you are a bank and you are, and you are trying to enter the, um, 
the online market. So the, the online banking market more and more and more. And this can be because you just are not present there. Maybe you don't have a very good uh, you know, online banking uh, system or because you actually want to start competing with banks that are maybe only online or mainly online. So they cut on costs, they can offer different services, they can offer better exchange fees and so on. So if you are doing it, but your competitor is not doing it, this is, a, uh, this is an advantage. Right, there's a benefit. So once you have all of, so you start discussing with the providers of these services, you start negotiating, you start having agreements, you start developing a commercial a commercial offer. All of this takes time, right? So if you have it and the other one doesn't, even if even once you launch it, then this other one will need to catch up, and it will take time, it will take money, and it, it may not even uh, get to the same point that you that you are. So this information, it is key. It is key to know that you want to do that. It is key to know how you're gonna do it. It is key to know who you are discussing with. So all of this is something that you would want to do immediately. You would want to discuss and say, oh, actually, I'm thinking about doing it. Are you thinking as well? Or are you, or do you have actually partnership doing someone? Or maybe the other party is more advanced on that thing and you can say, okay, so, can we? Can I get the same? Can I use the same agreements for, for example, the change fees or the same agreements for exchange rates? So there are there are a lot of there are a lot of um, elements, let's say, of course, of overlap between competitors in particular, but also between vertically related companies in particular, and and all of these can be discussed to a certain extent, but they cannot be implemented. So you can start thinking about what you could be doing, but you cannot do it. And there is another important thing, which is, and you need safeguard. So you cannot exchange information freely. It's not the buyer and the seller. It's certain people at the buyer, certain people at the target. So I'm gonna go there in a second. Just wanted to mention this because a lot of times this is forgotten. So. You have the signing, pre-signing, post-signing. So if you have an agreement or you don't have an agreement, and then at a certain point you have an agreement and you have a clearance. So you can close. From an antitrust, let's say merger regulation perspective, you can go ahead. You can close, you can become one company, you can integrate from a, from a merger control perspective. But you are still two independent companies. The fact that you got an authorization doesn't mean that you need to go through with a transaction. So you are still in a situation where you can go through with it, but you are not yet there, right? So you are still independent. So before you integrate, before you become one company, you are two companies. It seems strange uh, to, to, to put it this way, but it is that simple. Either you are two or you're one. So if you're one, you're one, no problem, you can do whatever you want within the one, right? If you're two, because you are not, you haven't integrated, you haven't transferred the control, you are still two and you should behave as separate companies. And this is extremely important because sometimes you have several different um, parties. So even if you got authorization in Europe, maybe you are still waiting for authorization in Brazil. And in these cases, you can integrate somewhere and you cannot integrate somewhere else. But still you need to integrate. So first you close and then you can actually act as you control the outcome. So going to the safeguards, so this is extremely important from a, from a, um, a practical perspective. So what happens? So we said that, that, you, that you couldn't normally exchange information. We're saying that at the same time you should exchange information. So these two kind of contradict each other. Uh, so in order to do that, uh, first of all, you need a, you need a justification. So the justification is maintaining the value, is valuing the target, is um, planning integration. So you need the justification, and then you need a safeguard. So the safeguard makes sure that you are not damaging competition more than it is needed. That's it. So why would you? So if you exchange information between two business people, right? This is the best possible exchange of information because at that point, the two are directly competing, they're active in the same, in the same uh, market, they're active in the same industry, they're active in the same division, they know each other maybe already. 
they have the same expertise. So this is the best possible exchange of information because you're gonna get the best out of it. For sure, you can align, you don't need anybody else to provide information, you don't need anybody to, uh, to fill anybody in because you, the, both, the two of them know everything. The issue is that, of course, if you exchange information with someone that is directly competing with you, directly competing with you, then he will use this information. I mean, he cannot not use this information once he has it, while he is still competing with you. So if you tell this person, that is the person responsible for the uh, development of the banking offer online, that you are actually developing a banking offer, that you're using this provider, that you're getting these fees and so on, the day after, this person will not just say, oh yeah, let's wait for the, for the transaction to close and then start actually doing something. It will just start. It will start even more if he knows that the transaction may not go through. So the more he knows that you're not one company, the more he's going to use the information. And in any event, everybody will tell him, yeah, but you need to still compete. You need to keep on competing as hard as possible. So this is the normal, rational thing to do. And so we cannot assume and we cannot even ask people that are active in the business, that are, that are competing with each other every day, that are going out uh, to customers, to not use all of the information they have to actually get the customer or get the supply or get the best, the best uh, rates. So because of that, these people cannot exchange information with each other. So, uh, the, so the clean team works in a way in a, in a, um, uh, with the identification of specific number of people, normally a limited number of people that are not involved in the business. So this of course creates issues because the person that is in the clean team doesn't really know the business that well. It may be someone that has been hired specifically for the transaction. It may be someone that is just, for example, that normally is the legal counsel of a, of the of the company. They just gets the information, knows the company a little bit, but is not actually going out and um, getting customers. Let's say. Um, so this is extremely important. So a lot of times the council needs to review it. And one of the issues in Altis, for example, was that in, in addition to having no PT, is that the, the CFO was involved in the exchange of information. So at that point, it is exactly the same as if you were two companies, it was one company, correct? So you have the CFO discussing, getting information, and going back to his people and ask, okay, can we do this and give me the information that I need to give the other party and so on. So that is exactly what's going to happen once the transaction closes. But before the transaction closes, you are two competitors. So you can exchange information that you need, but only with the limited, with the, um, for that purposes. And, and these purposes normally do not need the business person to be involved. So it is more complicated. It needs more iterations. It needs a lot of time. For example, the legal counsel of the company to go to the business people and say, I cannot tell you why I'm asking this information. I cannot tell you, and even the question itself, cannot include the reason, for example, why you're asking this information, as long as it is not uh, one of those indicated there directly. So it can be a sub-reason for it, and a lot of times, uh, of course, the business person will have difficulties sharing this information because it doesn't know what this information is gonna be used for. So there are a lot of difficulties in doing it, but the way to, this is the only way to do it. I mean, you cannot have a business person in the clinic. So the clean team is a clean, has to have clean hands and not, not touch the business because, because they will have confidential information. So they will get the information, the legal counsel, for example, of the company will get the information and he cannot use it. He cannot use it. He can only use it for these purposes that we discussed before, which normally start and end. So it's, I need to plan for integration, so I need this information. I will gather this information and we'll say that because I cannot integrate. So I will just get the information, I will collect everything I need, I will organize it as long as I can, but it stays there. It doesn't go further, because the next step is going to the business people to integrate. It doesn't get, it doesn't get that far. But at least you have the first step, which is, which is already uh, happening. So what happens normally is that one side says, I will need this, 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 this information to integrate. Can you start gathering them? So the, the local council, the legal council will start asking business people, can you give me this? Can you prepare the information in this format? And so on, and then it stops there. 
Uh, of course, it is different if you have a same. Well, actually, it's like very similar if you have a if you have a request for for information. So you get the request for information. You ask the other side, can you give me this information? You get the information, and then it stays within lawyer and legal counsel or the team. It doesn't get out of it. It just stays there and then goes to the authority. So there is no, there cannot be, um, there cannot be a breach, let's say, of the team. The, the information cannot go out of the team. The other, the other element is the dapper room. So this is this is important during the, um, in particular during the due diligence. So pre-signing. So before signing, what you want to do is to is to have all of the data that is needed to evaluate the business in a data room. And then this data room will have its own rules and only some people will have access to it. Only, only, uh, um, and, this and this is different, of course, depending on the, on the company. So you will have some companies that are, for example, not competitors and can have access to certain information. Some that are competitors that cannot have access to that specific folder. You have the, law, the legal counsel that may have access to more data than the business person that needs just to evaluate the business for that specific transaction. And in that case, it needs that specific information. And still, whenever the information is um, competitively sensitive, so one of the strategic data that we discussed before, most of the times so that is that either legal counsel or the lawyer or both review the data and says, okay, this you need and this you don't. So you have, a, for example, a say presentation. You have 50 pages. And the reason why you're providing this presentation is let's say the um, forecast. So you think that the market is gonna go in one direction and your company is gonna go in that direction faster than the market, you're gonna get you're gonna you're gonna you're you're gonna have certain results and so on. The presentation itself may have a lot of other information, including just for example analysis of the forecast. But this may maybe is not needed. So what you do is you have to black out everything that is not absolutely necessary. So it's not just the piece of document, let's say the document is not the piece of information, it is the individual, it is the individual piece of information within a bigger, let's say, uh, reel of, of information that is contained in the document, for example. So this is extremely important, it is very important that the council reviews the data because sometimes there may be something that is necessary, something that is not. And and if you think about the data, I don't know whether we have it here, but the data itself, in addition to being important, the topic of the data, let's say the, the subject of the data, it is also important the way in which the data is presented. So one thing is to present your pricing policy, one thing is to present your average prices, one thing is to present your prices to a specific customer, or the price or the cost you are paying or the cost of a specific product or your average cost. So the aggregation of the data is fundamental. It's completely different because one thing is to tell the buyer, I am making, I don't know, 5% EBITDA. And one other thing is to say on this specific um, contract, I am making 1 million. It is completely different because when I when I discuss about my business in general, that is enough sometimes or most of the times to evaluate that business because I'm buying the entire business. One other thing is if I'm discussing one specific relationship, for example, or one specific customer. In that case, I'm giving information that is probably much much less useful to evaluate the business as a whole, but it is much more useful to compete on that customer. Right? So the more individualized, the more specific, the more detailed, the more granular the information is, the worse it is. And of course the same goes with age. So the, the, the older the data is, the less relevant it is to determine your conduct. And therefore to determine the conduct of the, of the party that is gonna get the information. So going to the cases, this, this one, I mean the two cases are very well known I think. Um, this is not that important when it comes to exchange of information. This is not the case about uh, exchange of information. But what's interesting is how it relates to the other one, let's say to one piece. And the fact that the, um, the, the court specifically said only actions, only behaviors that contributes to the change of control. 
So if it is not changing control, if it's not implementing the transaction, then it is not a breach of condition, right? And in the, that case, it was unilateral and independent decision. Now, this is, I think, I think it's very important to always remember that there is a evidence, uh, there is the, there's an evidence burden on depending, uh, it starts with the commission, say, and then goes on the parties in determining whether it's unilateral and independent. So even if you, so let's assume that the target starts disclosing data, you know, just, just sends data, sends information because for whatever reason they decided they think, okay, I, it's actually, we're actually uh, one company, so why, why should I keep this from them? I actually want to show them that I'm proactive. So for whatever reason, people at the buyer, at the target start sending data to the buyer without the buyer having asked for it. The issue is that when this happens, right, it's you still need to do something. So even if you get the data, you still need to respond. You still need to say, no, you cannot send me this data and I have deleted it. So it is not sufficient to say, yeah, but it was, it was just them. They just sent the data. We didn't do anything. We didn't ask for it. First of all, because of course, there is also a, a potential uh, infringement in just doing nothing and getting the data and using it. But also, because sometimes it is difficult to actually demonstrate that it was unilateral. I mean, it is much more normal that the target sends you something at last, right? So at that point, if there is no other explanation, then it will be for you to demonstrate the negative, which is kind of impossible, right? So if, I, if the target starts giving you data that you need to compete and you use this data to compete, even if it was a unilateral decision, then it is still a breach, very, very likely. It is a very, let's say, uphill battle if this happens. In that case, it was just, in that case as well. Right? I mean, in that case, it was interesting because even in that case, the, there was the um, the termination of a cooperation agreement. So KPMG decided to terminate this its cooperation agreement because it needed to do so at a certain point in time, and it just decided to do it immediately. In that case, it wasn't as problematic as it was for competition. So probably that's also the reason why they didn't go into details. But who says that it wasn't EY to tell them to, to, uh, to terminate the agreement? And it is very unlikely that this never came up in the discussions, right? So you have two companies that decide to merge, or one decides to buy the other one, and, and they both know there is this cooperation agreement that cannot stay in place. They will have discussed it, for sure. And maybe someone from EY could have said, yeah, so maybe you can already start actually terminating it with effectiveness as of the, um, the clearance. So it is not impossible that there has been something, let's say, that will tip the balance into the bilateral, let's say, or into the influence. So in this case, there wasn't, apparently. But always be very, very careful to do that, just not to do it and say, no, it wasn't me. Because there is a very difficult evidentiary um, obligation to, uh, to actually uh, fulfill. So Altis, we know it, I think. Uh, it's, it was, this is the first, this is the first decision on gun jumping when it comes to exchange of information. There are a lot of other decisions on gun jumping, but when it comes to exchange of information, this is the first one that actually gives a lot, a lot of guidance, a lot. I mean, there are a lot of pages on exchange of information. So all of this, I mean, this can be presented in a lot of different ways, but I've heard a lot of people saying, yeah, but I mean, the, uh, the, co the commission always says, yeah, it is an additional element to the overall infringement. It is an additional element that demonstrates that the size of the, the, size of the influence was gained and exercised. It is, that is definitely what the commission says. But the question is, if there was nothing else and there was just, continuous meeting, meetings between the management, uh, including the CFO and other people, uh, pretty much everybody that was, that was of any relevance for the exchange, um, exchanging any type of information to the point that, of course, they were using this information and discussing how to proceed on the market where they were competing. 
Uh, this is of course all based on the decision, huh? so that they, this may all be wrong. Huh? Just take into account that this is this decision is is been appealed. So everything I say is what's in the decision. Then maybe uh, the court will uh, will uh, will say differently. Um, so it wasn't the case. Um, so they exchanged very detailed information. They did it frequently. The buyer was asking specifically for information. Even specific information can give it that information without any justification whatsoever, without any clean team, without any non-disclosure agreement. So when it is that obvious, and maybe not this case, but let's say that a case like this, right, happens, will the authority say, well, yeah, but that's not enough. The, yeah, they were, they were um, behaving as if they were one company, but there was no change of control. Because they couldn't really, there was never one time where Altis said, do this, and they did it, for example. I, I think that that will be a bit difficult. Because when you, when you are that much <coughs> into the business of the other side, you will influence each other. And in the best case scenario, you will influence just yourself. You will get all of the information and you will use it to compete with the other side. And, but in, a, in most cases, you will provide some information will suggest something, or you will give a comment and say, oh, but actually you're paying so much for that, for that product, and paying so much less. So even in that case, you're just, you're just coordinating. You're just using the information, using the people that are involved to just behave as if you were more common. And if that happens, of course, and this was kind of a very plain case, as, as far as it's pre as been presenting, presented, uh, then there is no reason to conclude that there was, uh, that the two companies were separate and were acting independently online. Yeah, we, still, we still have 10 minutes, but let's see if, if we have uh, any questions from the room. Uh, or maybe there's been someone in the room that has passed through a similar experience. You know, you, you cannot uh, uh, necessarily need to say that it's your experience, but you can also appoint a friend, uh, a virtual one that has went through a similar one. Um, or, or if not, I have a question. On the, on the previous slide, you, you had uh, this discussion on, on the confidentiality uh, arrangements, the fact that in this case there wasn't any, or it was a very limited one, I, it, it was not clear. So, so basically, uh, in order to, um, let's say, cover this aspect, you must include the, the, the issues that you presented earlier, the data rooms and the clean, and the clean uh, team in, in, the, uh, in your acquisition to present that to the competition authority. Would that be enough? Um, would also how this is being applied be, be one step further? So the, um, the, the, short quest, the short response is yes. Because and the reason the reason for it is that it is extremely unlikely that there will be an, a, um, an exchange of information where there is either no need for any data or where the data just um, let's say uh, normally let's say, as a normal uh, behavior stays within let's say for example the two people exchanging it which were not from the business so. If you assume, if you think about the case in which either there is no need for any exchange of data, of course, in that case, you don't need the clean team because there is no need to change anything. But let's say that that is very unlikely. Or another case where you wouldn't need it is if the exchange happens already between clean people, let's say. Right? So it is legal counsel to legal counsel of the two companies. They speak to each other, they, they discuss it, and then they go back to their respective. Um, let's say CEOs or CFOs, and it, without disclosing any of the information that they have, they have uh, gotten, they just say, oh, this is actually a very good deal, and I think, I think it, the price is very good. Just trust me. So this is very, very difficult. So in most cases, is you need to exchange some data, and in most cases, this data will need to reach different people that may change during the transaction. So this is also important. The clean teams may get broader, bigger, and smaller. You may have different clean teams for different purposes. So it is not just you know three people that just see each other. It's, it is a little bit more complex than that. 
But with a clean team, these, then, then these people will sign a non-disclosure agreement or the clean team agreement, which also means that they are bound not to share the information further. So this was kind of the issue that was there in this case, because it is not just setting it up, it is what happens next. So what, what was happening is that they, the people, of course, were not the ones that should have gotten the information, and then they were giving the information to someone else. So at that point, you know, it doesn't stay within the clean team. So even if the clean team is correct, but then they, they sign nothing, right? Then they will, at a certain point, potentially discuss it with somebody else, and maybe this one couldn't be in the clean team. So as long as there is an exchange, then yes. The alternative would be to always go through the lawyers. But that is, that is a little bit, I would say, more costly and complicated. Uh, because it would mean to send all of the data to the lawyer, and then the lawyer would black out every confidential information, any competitive sensitive information. Uh, so you would it would either aggregate the data or eliminate everything that is individualized, anything that is that is in the list that we that we saw before. So it will just give give them the company what they can see, because it's very aggregated, because it's historic and so on. So you can do it without a clean team as long as there is someone that filters it. Or the two companies are very good and they, they can do it themselves within the company. So the company itself just blacks out everything that is not, that cannot be exchanged at all. And then it will be a very, a very black document, let's say. And it will just have the one information that can actually be exchanged and they will just give that. So, so, sorry, but if you have a black document, how can you evaluate the other company? Exactly. So, so you have a black document with just it's one. It's a black company. <laughs> it is called black. So that that is that is of course the risk, and that is the reason for the clean team. So the reason for the clean team is that you will start seeing something be behind what has been blacked out. So the blacked out, you can you will black out more the more the document goes, let's say, is spread around and circulates. So. The more people have access to the document, the more the document needs to have, you know, to be redacted. The, le the less people, the more selective the people are, the more, the more uh, identified the purpose of the exchange is, the less, let's say, restrictions you have within this, let's say, limited group of people that have signed the NDAs. So this is the reason for the clean team. It is to make it easier and make it faster and make it uh, more efficient, but then of course it takes time to actually set up the clean team, vet the people, and uh, and uh, get the agreements and so on. But once you have them, then it's it's great. Yes. Actually, I think it's easier to understand if we make the separation that you have done before. So before the signing of the transaction, we basically means before you decide to buy. It's one set of documents. It's clearly easier to understand what is necessary. Compared to the second part, where actually there is a signing, yes, and you just expect it to happen. I think this case is referring to implementing, yeah. and it's it's easier for lawyers to understand that uh, you know there is no necessity, and actually it's about implementation, not about uh, anything else. Yeah. My question would be around the first part. Yes. If you are aware about the uh, actual decisions on what was, um, you know, about uh, this whole process, uh, how to do this. So if you are aware about national or EU case law decisions related to what is needed pre-signing. Yeah. This is a very good, very good question and uh, the, uh, explanation. It is absolutely true. I mean, it is completely different pre-signing and post-signing. The type of data, the reason to get the data, the people involved, the, the companies involved on both sides, it's completely different. That's the reason to say to, to divide, uh, divide the two uh, at this moment. Um, there is no decision as far as I know. I mean, the Altis is the only decision as far as I know that actually goes into that many details. And uh, there are a lot of commentaries that specifically say it is good that we finally get some guidance on what actually needs to be done because, of course, you go to a lawyer and you get guidance, for sure, but even without the LPs, I mean, uh, they would be very happy to give it. Uh, but, of course, it was based on nothing. It was based on general uh, practices, it was based on the general on the general theory. Um, what is very interesting about this is that even though, 
as I'm presenting it, and you can see from the slides, it is kind of, it includes also these exceptions, right? So the idea that, yes, you can exchange information after signing, uh, if you are within these legitimate reasons, and you have safeguards, and so on. They keep on repeating, and maybe they were doing it on purpose, that it is not due diligence. So the, 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 they keep on saying it, they keep on saying, yeah, and, and they exchange the information not in the context of the due diligence, and they exchange the information after signing. So that was, that is a very, let's say, politically odd specification, because of course you will have a lot of exchange information after the, after the, the signing. But the commission seems to take the position there implicitly that during the due diligence, it is much, much, much more justified, and you can go much farther than you would go after signing. So absolutely, 100%, you can see it in Altis a little bit because of this specification that is not necessary, in my opinion, because of if there wasn't, that, that, if that wasn't the reason to, uh, to include it, because you have reasons to, to, uh, to, ex to exchange also afterwards. But the commission seems to put due diligence as the the, the, the the king or the queen reason. Exactly, exactly. But the commission recognizes it. So it is true that during the due diligence, the idea, although they don't really go into details because it was about that, but it is true that there is this there is the idea that you can exchange more. The issue there is, and, and the reason why this issue exists, I think, is also because there is no guidance, is that the general idea is, yes, but during the digits you need to execute your you need to evaluate the target. So you need detailed information about this business, while afterwards you don't. So this is the perception. The risk is to go too far. So there is, uh, I mean, I, 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 I was speaking with uh, some companies, and they said, I mean, sometimes I just participate to bits just to get the information. So, and, and to see, you know, how the market is going, where, it, where the market is going, and what is this company doing, and so on. So, that is not very good for the company to be sold. It's not very good for the market. So, there is this risk. And, and in my professional experience, I have seen this the use of the data room in a more, let's say, uh, let's say advanced and complex, complex way than just putting stuff in and then accessing to it. So a folder that was accessible only to certain people, certain documents that were redacted before going on the data room, uh, certain other documents that were accessible to a clean team that was created specifically for those purposes, different data rooms for the PE funds and the competitors and the, the, other, the, the other company, the industrial investors, let's say. So, it, it, it's if one wants to be certain that there are not going to be issues later on, then it should take into account that the, that at the due diligence stage, it is even less likely that the transaction is actually going to happen, which means that it is true that you need the information, that there is a bigger justification, but there is also a much bigger risk of, uh, of an anti-competitive effect, right? Because if the transaction, and this is also an interesting part, I mean, if the transaction goes per, goes goes uh, through, and so you, you you negotiate, you sign, and you close, and the two companies become one, yes, you anticipate the effects, right? But you just anticipate something that will happen later on, and still you 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 are fine. Imagine if you anticipate the effects without the transaction happening, it just because it's a bidding process and this one doesn't win. So it, it is true, one hundred percent. It is a, a, absolutely like that, and the commission seems to to confirm that, so there is kind of, this is kind of support for that. But it's very important thing to be careful, even with the data. And sometimes with very, very complicated transactions, you have clean things even before signing. Although most of the times it's just after signing, because of these just to discuss, mainly for the, mainly for very innovation.
section in the SPA which regulates what happens between signing and closing. Mm -hmm. When usually there are restrictions for the target company which shouldn't do certain acts without the prior approval of the buyer. Yeah. So does this constitute gun jumping? So, okay. this is a very good question. That there is a reason why I didn't touch upon that, uh, which is that it is not exchange of information. So just we're, we're getting a little bit out of it, but it's very, very connected because, of course, when you have to check that you know the target is not doing something, as we were saying before, that you need the information, right? So it is very, very connected, plus sometimes you want to veto, for example, something, or you want to, so you need the information about this something in order to decide whether they can go for further or not. So it is very, very connected. The, the, the best decision on that is at this, of course. Uh, they have a lot, they, they have even more, uh, they, they've discussed it even more than exchange of information. So, uh, also there is the same. So, you have certain reasons, certain justifications, which are closer. So, it's this one, right? So, as long as it is just to maintain the value, right? So, it's just like you are a minority investor and you don't want them to do like crazy things, completely different from what they were doing before then it is no way justified, which means that it is also justified the information that you get. So you will get some information in order to check that you know this, that the target is not acting in a way that was against, let's say, the SPA. And in that case, it is, let's say, justified under one reason. So that you have, you have that exception. And this is, this is definitely an exception because that is a limitation to competition. It is like a non-compete, let's say. So it's, it is a smaller non-compete. So it just says, you cannot do this, this specific thing that you would have done otherwise. That you could have done. Maybe you want to make, to buy a new facility, or you want to sign a new agreement for a new online platform, or for a new big customer, or for a new, for example, supplier. And this agreement is much, much bigger than anything you have signed before. It's the next step for your company. Well, if you are being acquired, then maybe it's better if you don't do it until you know, the, the, the buyer actually can decide whether that is fine or not. So if it is outside of the ordinary business, outside, that is normally fine because the idea is you, have, you bought the company, you bought the company, you signed the agreement, and you will, if the transaction is clear, become the owner of this company, and therefore, it makes sense for this company to run as it was run before and not differently in order for you to get what you actually signed for. So that is normally fine. The, the risk is, the difficulty in, in including these clauses is that sometimes you have these, uh, you have very, very detailed um, limitations and some that's, that goes that go that go into the business. So the idea is just that you are actually deciding how the target will be run from the moment of signing onwards entirely. So you cannot launch no pro new products. So you can only launch new products if these products are I don't know uh, cost less than X or something like that. So the, the more you go into detail, or you cannot sign any new agreement that is valued more than ten thousand euros. So depending on the industry and depending on how the business no, is normally run, so it depends a lot on the industry because in some industries you will have you only huge contracts. So it doesn't make any sense to have you know, a, a threshold that is, that is very low. Threshold can be, can be very, should be very high because if you, if you put it too low, then this company cannot do anything. It is completely blocked because every agreement that they sign will be above something. So it all depends on the industry. But yes, if you, if you include these, these um, clauses that are too restrictive and they go into normally I say the, the ordinary business, if they go that much into it, then it is already considered just by that, even without the, the need for the clause to actually apply, it is already considered kind of Because you are gaining by signing, and this is the interesting part about this or that, you are gaining by signing the agreement, you are gaining um, influence on the target, the size of the influence on it. So, as, as soon as you sign, 
then in theory you're infinite. Because you don't need to actually use it, you just need to gain it. So this is, uh, I, didn't, I didn't cover it here on purpose, but, but this is an extremely interesting point because this means that when you are drafting the SPA without an exchange of information, without any contact with the other side, you have to be very careful because if you include too detailed uh, rights that go into the ordinary business of the target, you, as you sign and you breach. So, you, so even just on that basis, you risk the authority starting a business against you. Okay, so to wrap it up, See? Yeah, one more question from here. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, just a little bit of a follow-up question on this. You also man mentioned the threshold that we usually see in the SPAs and how the, uh, the concerns of the buyer must be related to, the, to the, uh, what is outside the ordinary course of business. How, how, do, how should we analyze this in practice? Should it be a percentage above the, the usual threshold or the normal threshold in that industry or with respect to that? particular target, would it, I don't know, 10% over that? Would it be okay? Would it need to be a higher one? Or how, how do you see this? Looking at numbers, because we, we see thresholds all the time with respect to supplier agreements, customer agreements, maybe even the, the, um, uh, the salary at top man management uh, position if uh, filled in during that period. So what, what, what do you think of, of this? Uh, so it is, this is a very good question, it is of course as always the like, million dollar question. Uh, so I'm not going to get that in my million dollars. Uh, no, so it's, it is, it is, there is no fixed, let's say, uh, limit. It doesn't, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, competition law does not work like that at all. Like, it is probably one of the laws that is the furthest from being like clear cut. The furthest from that, which also means that you can, that you can, uh, argue and a lot so it, it is much it, it adapts much 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 more to the specific industry to the specific transaction to the specific uh, company but to respond to your question the idea the idea of these clauses and the reason why these are are let's say considered conjunctive is that the idea is that by getting these rights you're actually getting control so you're controlling the other company so it is and this is the reason. So normally you go back to the definition of control, which is you know, which includes also you know the, the appointment of the senior management, the veto over the appointment of the senior management. So you go to the negative control because normally these are vector rights. So you go to the definition of negative control, which is still very you know uh, blurry. Uh, but what you do in this individual situation is you look at how the company runs. And you think about what can happen in the future. So you just say, so what has happened in the past? What type of agreement this company was signing would need to sign in the coming, for example, 12 months, assuming that the transaction will close in 12 months. So you think, okay, what, what does this company need in order to be run as efficiently as it was run before? And then this, this is your, let's say, ordinary course of business. And it can be more or less specific. And the thing is that given that you can justify it, right, that you can explain it, and it is case specific, then you can, the, the more you go into details, the better it is in understanding what is the ordinary, the ordinary course. So you don't, so in some cases you can have similar contracts, so you can say this contract plus 10%, for example, for example, to account for inflation, to account for increasing prices in that specific industry or, or otherwise. Or, but in most cases, I think, you would have very different contracts, very different uh, amounts, very different type of activities, and very different veto rights as well. So if you already know that you will need to do something, or that you think that you may need to do something, the, uh, it is very important to be careful in allowing the other side to veto that. Because the veto, I mean, the veto that is allowed is the one that is justified by maintaining the value. So if I have run the business in a certain way so far, and you decided that that business makes sense to be bought for that price and so on. You cannot tell me that now I cannot run it as I was running it before, right? So this is the idea behind the extraordinary, right? So what you want to block is the business to going in a different direction. 
So this is the reason why sometimes it is difficult to justify something. Because if you give too many deeper rights, even on, it's very simple. Either you, either you are giving like very little uh, power, potentially no power, in the ordinary course. So the idea is, yeah, I'm giving you the, the, the authority to block and to veto any acquisition above one million, but I never bought anything above one million, ever, right? So you see, no authority will ever tell you anything about that. Because it's like, you never did it, why would you do it now? But if I do something that actually is of value, and this is the reason why it is more complicated, so I actually do want to block something, then the risk is that you get into the ordinary business very quickly. Because if you say, okay, uh, actually, okay, you never spent one million. So let, let's see what you spent most. Oh, 500,000. How many times did you spend 500,000? Five times. Okay, I don't want you to spend 500,000 again. And, and, then, and then maybe that is what you did yesterday, what you did uh, you know, a month before and six months before. So in that case, of course, what you're saying is you cannot do that anymore. But then you have to justify it with the value of the business. So it is, yeah, I valued your business based on these previous acquisitions. But they don't think you should do them anymore. But then you see that they start to control you. So yes, there is no, unfortunately, there is no clear threshold. But more, the clearest, the clearest you can go is ordinary course. So you go back and you see what you did before. You think about what you will do in the future, and then you, you stay away from that. So I, I will do these slides very quickly. In any event, you have them. Uh, you already have them. Um, so yeah, so this is just a, a summary of what we have discussed. So first of all is what data you are, you are disclosing, as long as you are not disclosing this. So you're not disclosing detailed, granular data, individualized, current, so non-historic, uh, about these or other um, strategic data, so what you're competing on the most. Can be fees, can be R&D, can be new products, can be anything, commercial. As long as you're not disclosing that, most of the times you can go ahead and exchange. Uh, or it is easier to exchange. You may want to just check who has access to it, but it is easier. And this is what happens most of the times in the due diligence space, right? So in the due diligence space, you try and stay away from this, from this, as, long, as much as you can. So you may, it may be individualized, but it may not be detailed, it may be, it may be aggregated within the company, for example. It may be not current, you go historic, so you avoid, for example, you want to give sales, you don't give sales data of the last year, you give the one of the year before. So you can try and find a way to steer away from these data. Uh, if you need to exchange these data, then you need to have a name and to have a safeguard. So the aim is what we discussed before. So these are the, the, the aims. You have the due diligence, which is pre-signing, and then you have protecting, preserving the value of the target. Uh, planning, integration, and uh, responding to the commission's request. And the safeguards are mainly these two with the, with the, in, um, with the inclusion of counsel. So you have the data room and the clean team, which are the most useful and, and best ways. Of course, then you, have, you can have multiple clean teams, you have, can have multiple folders in the data room. So it is more complicated than that, but these are the most common ones. And then, and of course, different agreements within the clean team. So you have the clean team arrangement, you have the NDA, the non disclosure group. So it is a complicated, let's say, potentially uh, legal structure, but this is what you would, what you would normally have. And then, normally, the lawyer gives you the additional, let's say, uh, check. So potentially, if you do everything right here, I mean, you don't need the lawyer, but most of the times you want, you know, maybe a lawyer to check who is in the clean team. And say, oh, actually, the authority may, because it's kind of like, it's kind of a third party. It's kind of what the authority will probably look at. So the authority will say, okay, show me the clean team members. And then if, the, if within the clean team members there is a CFO, then the, uh, the count, which happens, uh, the council will tell you, yeah, no, this person cannot be part of the clean team already before actually being in front of, a, of a, the authority. You will review the, the information and then will redact what is either competitively sensitive or non-necessary or both. So sometimes it can be non-competitively sensitive but non-necessary and you may be just on the safe side just deleting it. Sometimes it can be competitively sensitive but not necessary and then you just have to redact it. So this is the reason why even within the clean team, sometimes you have to redact stuff. 
because it's not necessary, it's not justified by this. Um, that's it. Then you have meetings, potentially, uh, in that case, it's better to have, a, to have a lawyer present. And it's always important that employees know what's happening so that they should keep on doing business as usual and compete. 